Hello, Anita. Hi, Lilu. How are you? Good. It's good to be with you. It's good to see you in person after everything that I've heard about your story and the miracle of, of you being alive right now. I know. It feels great. And I'm so excited to be interviewed by you. Thanks to Wayne Dyer. He's such a beautiful spirit. Oh, Wayne Dyer is absolutely amazing. Interviewing him was a miracle uh, on the Jesus Living Tour when I was in Hawaii meeting him and and um, what a beautiful soul he is. And he spoke so highly of you. He gave me right during this interview, at the end of the interview, your full story printed out. And I read it. And I'm like, I have to meet this Anita. I have to uh, get to know her and, and really share your story with the world, as many people as I can, because there's so many beautiful lessons. Really, you had a major near-death experience, one where, well, 30... You we had only 36 hours to live, right? You were yeah, at, a, absolutely. Tell us, at best 36 hours. Um, tell us it, about your cancer, because you had a cancer already for many years, but you were only given a few hours. There was billions of cancer cells in your body, and yet they disappeared quite miraculously, huh? Yeah, they did. Um, well, actually, I had cancer for almost four years, and... Um, and then and it, I was diagnosed in 2002, and it was lymphoma, and it started to spread. At first, I really didn't want to have any chemotherapy because I was really scared of chemotherapy. I'd seen two people die who were on chemotherapy. So, um, But the cancer, unfortunately, spread, even though I was trying a lot of different alternative things. And I'm looking back on hindsight, I know that the major reason was because of a lot of fear that I was going through at the time. Um, but at the end of 2005, I had a, a body scan and the, and the doctors told my husband, they didn't tell me, they told my husband that I had three months to live at best. They said that's at best. But um, six weeks later, I fell into a coma. But during that time, even before falling into a coma, I was already, um, like I couldn't walk. My muscles were all completely wasted. I was completely emaciated. I had huge open skin lesions. Um, I was breathing with the aid of an oxygen tank. I couldn't breathe unaided. Um, my lungs were filled with fluid, so I was constantly coughing and choking. I couldn't walk because my muscles had deteriorated. Uh, if I went out, my husband would have to take me in a wheelchair. And even though I was being treated uh, in and out of hospital, I didn't want to stay in hospital, so I was going home and then I had a full-time nurse, but on the morning of February the 2nd, I didn't wake up, mm -hmm. and, it, and apparently my body completely swelled up, and my husband called my doctor, and he said to just rush me to the hospital, and so, my, and the doctor said to rush me to, it was a different hospital, it was like one of the best cancer clinics in Hong Kong, so my husband rushed me to that hospital. And when I went into that hospital, the doctors uh, basically said that this was it. I was dying. And it's even written in my medical records that they informed my family that this was it. I wasn't going to come out of the coma. And these were my last few hours. Mm -hmm. It would be 36 hours at the most. That was all I had. And they said my organs had now shut down. And that's why I was in the coma. And that's why my body had completely swelled up because my organs had stopped functioning and so all the toxins were building up and my skin lesions were, they were weeping because they were, um, because the toxins were coming out of the skin lesions. Um, so I was in like a really bad state and the doctor said that um, I had tumors like the size of lemons from the base of my skull all the way down like under my arms and uh, down my chest and all the way down to below my abdomen. Wow. And, and my brain was filled with fluid as well. Mm. And so there was like no chance at all. But while everybody thought that I was in a coma, um, I was just in this really, really beautiful place. It was, um, I mean, it was really, really amazing. And I was aware of everything that was happening around me. Mm. I was aware of um, my family being really distraught and, and, and actually it's quite emotional because 
I didn't understand why they were so distraught because I was feeling so good. I was feeling, I was feeling really free, like all that pain of all and all that suffering from the last few years of having the cancer and and all the pain in my body and everything. I was free from it. I felt really light, really, really light. And then I felt as though I was like surrounded by what I can only describe as unconditional love. Um, it's it's more than that. I mean, even the word love, it just doesn't do justice to it. It it was it's like it's like a feeling like you're home. You know, it's very very comforting, and and it was a very welcoming and comforting feeling. And I was aware that uh, I I could see and hear and feel everything that was happening, and not even what was around me, but. Um, I, I saw the doctors telling my husband and my mom, who was there, that that this that my organs had shut down and and that was it. I was dying. Mm -hmm. They called my brother to tell him to come. He was not in Hong Kong, and they called him to tell him I was dying and that he better rush over. Now, my brother, uh, even before he got the call from my husband, he already sensed something was wrong. So he already started booking a flight. And he couldn't get a flight in the town he was in, so he actually hired a car to drive three hours to the next town to get a flight. And there was a sense of urgency that he just wanted to come and be here with me. And and while I was in that state, I was even aware of my brother and what he was doing, and and him getting on the plane and coming to see me. And then I had this feeling that I don't want to die before he comes here. I don't want him to see my body just laying there dead because that would be quite distressing for him. And I just had that feeling that I didn't want to do it. I kind of, my brother's older than me, but I, I sort of just felt a sense of protectiveness over him. And a lot of what happened while I was in that state is quite confusing because it didn't feel like time runs linear. It feels like everything was happening at the same time. Like whatever I brought into my awareness, it was happening in front of me. You know, whether I was thinking, whether I brought my husband into my awareness, he was there and I, and I understood my purpose with him. I understood that his purpose and my purpose was linked and we were meant to be in this life together. And if I, I understood that if I died, he would die as well. He would follow me soon after. Um, he wouldn't be able to fulfill his purpose, and I. Um, and then I became aware of my father. His presence was just around me because my father had passed away ten years before that, and um, my, you know, and, and um, at the time when I was growing up, I used to have a lot of, um, I would say, differences with my father because he's quite. Orthodox Hindu, and I used to rebel against it. Like he'd wanted me to have an arranged marriage, and I didn't. Mm. So there were a lot of Orthodox, like a lot of differences. But in that state, it was really amazing. It's like we're without our culture, we're without our egos, without our bodies, and I felt nothing but unconditional love from him. How um, amazing! Yeah. So that was. It so was. You like, were surrounded, really, or you could bring in your in that space, the people that you love and wanted to be with and see. It was really effortless. Boom, as soon as you had that thought, they were there and you were experiencing them from an unconditional point of view. Absolutely, yes. Because it was like um, thoughts, if you can even call it thoughts, it was like awareness. You bring something into your awareness and it's instant, instantly, it's just there it's happening it's right in front of you there's no time lapse and and even coming back into this realm it's very hard to put everything into a sequence because it all felt like it was happening at the same time mm -hmm. I was even aware of other lives it was as though I had lived other lives but I was watching those lives not like they were past lives but like they were actually happening there in front of me. So it's like all of time exists at the same time. There is only now. There is only the present moment. And 
everything is happening at the present moment, the past, the present, the future, because I saw the possibility of the future, of whether I lived or I died. I saw both possibilities, and it could have gone either way. And you had a choice. I had a choice of whether I wanted to come back or not. And, <clears throat> and at first, I really didn't want to come back. Um, I didn't want to come back because... It felt so good. It was just, yeah, it felt really good. And, and, and I didn't want to come back to that heavy, burdensome, sick body. I mean, the body was just, my body was so wasted. I just thought there was no use. And, and that body was not just causing me pain, but it was causing pain for my whole family to see me like that. It was causing pain, my husband who was caring for me, my mother. So I really didn't want to come back. And when I was, when I had the thought of not coming back, it was like I saw that happening, that I, I hadn't come back. And then the, the doctors actually telling my family that I had died because of organ failure due to end stage cancer that had spread. And so um, I, I actually saw that happening and then the, my distraught family. But so, then, you were, so the doctor, you're saying, announced you were dead and the line was flat and the, your heart was not beating anymore and you were gone, medically gone. I was medically gone, medically gone. And then, um, but at the same time, I also, see, this is why it's so hard to put it all into sequence because I also started to get this understanding of why I got the cancer in the first place. Mm. I started to understand that the cancer was like a culmination of everything I was up to that point in life. And, and I had always been um, very fearful. Like I'd always feared letting people down, disappointing people. Uh, I had a lot of fears. You know, I feared cancer. I feared chemotherapy. I feared, uh, I feared eating the wrong foods you know, foods that cause cancer. And uh, I just lived a really fearful life. And everything that I did in life, I did out of fear, not out of love for myself or love for my body or love for who I was. But I did it out of fear, out of a fear for the consequences. Mm. And, and so I just completely understood that my life was just a culmination of fearful thoughts And it was everything, like right from the time I was a child, you know, whether it was fear of religion and fear, all kinds of fears. It's like even our spiritual beliefs and our religions, they're supposed to be um, empowering and, and uh, inspiring and make us feel love, not fear, not fear of death and fear of the afterlife and fear of punishment or fear of bad karma and all these things. And that that's... That's not right. We're not supposed to interpret religion that way. Yeah. So it's just the clarity was just amazing. I just felt this incredible clarity as to why I had the cancer and how all this fear had accumulated in my energy and in my physical body and, mm -hmm. and then creating illness in the end, like maybe through creating blockages in my body. And I realized that we're not supposed to live a life of fear. We're actually amazing, magnificent beings. And at our core, that's what we are. We are amazing, magnificent spiritual beings who are supposed to just live our truth and express who we are. And we're not supposed to be afraid to be who we are. We're not supposed to be, pretend to be something else. And... And I realized that, um, that I'd always been afraid to be who I am. Mm. And that's when I started to understand or realize that, that you know, we're, we're magnificent. And basically, I, I also felt the connection that all of us are actually connected. We're all one. We're all part of one consciousness. You know, we are all facets of God. Or we can call it whatever we like, but we are all one consciousness. We're all one and we're all connected. I started to also feel um, 
as I was aware of what was happening, like, uh, to my body and my family that was around me and my brother who had arrived in Hong Kong, I started to realize that I was able to feel all their emotions. Once I was without my body, from that perspective, it's like um, our bodies make us feel separate. But without the body, we're not separate. We're all one. Whatever I do, whatever I feel affects you and it affects everybody. And so in that state, it's very, very heightened, and I could feel everything that every doctor and every nurse was feeling. Um, I could feel everything that my brother, my mother, my husband, whatever they were all feeling. It was like I could feel their emotions. Was it, was it because you wanted to, or was it just coming to you? It was just coming to me. It was just coming to me, but it was like, as soon as my awareness was on them, I was feeling it. If my awareness was not focused on them, then I wouldn't feel it. But whatever I or whoever I focused my awareness on, I became, it's like you become them because it's like when, um, when I was, see, you can imagine how difficult this is because our language just doesn't have the right words. You're doing such a wonderful job. <laughs> I'm you. sure it's limiting for you, but for us, it opens up really a lot. So, uh, and, and you've shared your story, so I know that more is you're able to formulate it in some ways that you were probably not able to before. So it's it's such a blessing. Thank you. I I just hope to be able to help other people who are listening. Mm -hmm. It's like when it's like our body restricts us, and without our body, we can be everywhere or I felt as though I was everywhere at the same time. You know, I was here, there and everywhere, not restricted to one spot. And because there's no restriction, there's no boundary. I mean, there's this sense of amazing freedom and you're not even restricted. You're not restricted by time, space, boundaries, walls. But you're not even restricted by other people's physical bodies because the only thing that's real is our emotions. It's love. It's our emotions. It's what we feel. That's the only thing that's real. And that was what I felt from each person was their emotion. Mm. It's like you go beyond the body. So when I bring, when I was Whenever I had my awareness on anyone, it was beyond their physical body. All so, I felt was their emotion. So was it, were you connected directly to their soul or were you seeing also their physical perspective, their pain and suffering from you having passed away? I was like, I was able to feel their emotions, what they were feeling at that time. Um, to an extent, and this carried on because even after I came out of the coma, this the, the feeling didn't just disappear for the many weeks subsequent to that. I mean, even while I was in the hospital and while the doctors were treating me and the nurses were treating me, um, I was just, um, I could just feel that whatever they were doing, they felt they were doing what was best. I could just feel nothing but compassion for them. It was like I knew them. I felt as though I knew them. Mm -hmm. And, and um, in fact, I'm jumping ahead, but, but the doctors were conducting tests, which I didn't want them to conduct. And I was telling them, you don't need to conduct any more tests because I know I'm fine. I know you're not going to find anything. Hmm. I, you're just doing it to satisfy your own mind. You're not doing it for me. But at the same time, I felt a level of compassion towards them for needing to do this. <laughs> um, and I let them, and I just let them, and I thought, I know I'm fine. Uh, and so I'm just going to let them because I know now that I'm really invincible. Mm -hmm. And you were able to verify some information later. But tell us about that choice first before coming back and everything that happened afterwards. Tell us, because it's... It's quite um, spectacular. <laughs> um, so I was, then what happened is that I realized I had a choice 
of whether to come back or not, as I mentioned. And first I chose that I didn't want to come back. And then when I started to understand the magnificence of who we really are and who I really am and that my purpose hadn't been fulfilled, I then felt my father again. And um, he was really key in this because he said to me, um, he communicated to me, he said that um, it's not your time yet, you should go back. And mm. I felt at that time, in that moment, I felt, I don't want to go back into that body. I really don't want to go back. It's too painful. And then in that moment, I seemed to understand, and it could have been my father communicating this to me, or, um, you know, it could have been the the source that connects all of us. But I seemed to immediately in that moment understand that now that I knew the truth of who I am and what my purpose is, that my body would heal very quickly, that my body would just reflect this truth, that the body is not the real me. Now that I've discovered the real me, who I really am, the body would just reflect that. And I seemed to understand that. And um, I also felt the presence of many other beings, including my best friend who had passed away from cancer. I felt her presence and, and I had missed her a lot before then, but um, she was there and it was just really good to see her, to, to sense her there. And I sensed her presence and she was like really at peace, totally at peace. And that felt really good because I, it was like, feeling like you're embraced, you know, and and just being like you, you're surrounded by this ocean of unconditional love. Mm. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then I came to a point where my father actually said to me, this is as far as you can go. Oh. And he said, if you go any further than this, you won't be able to turn back. And he said, now I want you to go back. Go back and live your life fearlessly. And it was after that that I started to wake up from the coma. Mm. And then in that moment, were you told, um, I thought you were told that all the reports will be clear and everything will be clear, or did you come to that understanding as you were choosing? That was part of my understanding as I was choosing, as I started to understand, as I started to understand that um, my body would reflect, would mm -hmm. reflect the, the truth, what I now knew, which was the truth of who I really am. I then started to realize that I started to understand that my body would heal, but not just heal, but it would heal very rapidly and it would be a total healing. I really, I understood that. And I, and I also understood that I had a purpose, but I understood that I wouldn't have to work hard at figuring out my purpose. I just had to be myself and allow and the purpose would unfold before me. Mm. What and a beautiful I lesson for all of us. Another thank one. You. Thank you. And and I and that was the biggest thing I learned was that I just had to go and be myself and live life with abandon and my purpose would unfold before me. Mm. Just had to allow it, that's all. Not pursue it, but allow it. So from what I read too, Anita, you had a sense of or you still have a sense of being invincible. Yeah, Tell well, us more about that. It's been an amazing journey because everything I felt and sensed has just been confirmed after I came back. Because as I started to awaken, I was in a real blur when I started to come out of the coma. I was, I, it was like I had one foot on each side. I, I didn't, I didn't really understand what was happening. Um, and then I saw my brother was there. My, my husband was really ecstatic and he was, he had been whispering to me all through while I was in the coma. He was like whispering, standing, he was by my side. He never left my side 
because he didn't want to miss in case I had my last breath. And he'd been whispering that I'm waiting for you, come back, come back. And um, when I came out of it, he was there, my mom was there, my brother was standing there. And then when I saw my brother, I said, I said, hey, um, I knew you were here, you made it. And then he, he's, he looked at me and he said, how did you know? And, uh, but, but he was like smiling when we were, they were kind of like really happy saying, she's awake, her eyes are opening, and they started to call the doctor. And the doctor was a doctor that I had never seen before I entered the hospital in the coma. So when he came in, and I called him by name, I said, you know, good morning, Dr. Chen. And first he said, oh, wow, you're, you're up, I'm so glad. And then he said, but how did you know my name? And I said, aren't you the doctor that, uh, that, that saw me when I came into the hospital? And he said, but you were in a coma. Your eyes were closed. You, how could you, you couldn't have seen me. And I said, I was. I really had no idea I was in a coma because I could see everything. I said, I was in a coma? I really had no idea. And, um, and then he said, I came in to tell you good news. I came in to tell you that your organs have started functioning. And, um, and, I, and I looked at him and I said, but I knew that already. And he said, what do you mean you knew that? And, then, <laughs> and my family, <laughs> and family was, were, were like really happy. They looked at him and they said, they are? And he said, yeah, it's, it's um, really unusual. It's, it's miraculous. We never expected this. And that's really good news. And so then he just looked at me and he said, you better just get some rest. And, and then he, he left the room. And I said to my family, why did he look so shocked? Isn't he the doctor? <laughs> telling <them> that, yeah. <laughs> and I started telling them everything. I said, you know, he's the doctor that, um, that told you that I was going to die, that I don't have more than 36 hours. And, and my family said, but how did you hear that? My husband said, he said that to us outside the room. We weren't even in this room. And I said, are you sure? But I heard it. And then I, and then I said, are you sure I was in a coma? Because at four in the morning, I started choking and coughing. And then you and I said, you, my husband, um, you went and called the doctor, you called the nurses, and then they made an emergency call to the doctor, and then he took out fluid from my lungs, and I described the whole thing, and they were saying, you, how could you have seen that? They had no idea that I knew every single thing, and I even described to them how one of the male nurses had said, um, like, we can't find any veins, and anyway, um, she's really emaciated, I don't think she's going to make it. He basically um, had an air of like giving up on me, like he wanted to give up. And I actually mentioned this in my book. And then, and I mentioned this to, and I, and I told him that. And then my brother was actually really annoyed when he heard that. And he said, oh, I'm going to go have a word with him and tell him not to be so insensitive. Mm. And when he told them, <laughs> that male nurse, the male nurse was really shocked. He said, I had no idea she could hear me. And he came in and he apologized profusely. Um, so, it's, um, they were all really, really surprised. But then what happened is that um, they, they then started to tell me, okay, uh, you know, it, we're going to have to start treating you and, and, and taking tests to see the progress of your cancer. Uh, and we're going to wait till you're a little bit stronger because your body is really, really weak. And so within about uh, four days, though, I had wanted them to, I was, you know, on oxygen, actually within two days, I was telling them, I don't need this oxygen, it's getting in the way, you know, so I was like taking it off, and so they would, they tested my breathing, and they said, it's okay, we can take it off, then I told them, I want to take out the food tube, because I had a food tube down my throat, so they could feed food directly, I said, it's really uncomfortable, it's scratching my throat, I want to eat some real food, like oh. ice cream. <laughs> And so um, they, they reluctantly took that out. But I started to have um, a little bit of recollection. Interestingly, it was, I was still quite confused. And I started to realize something had happened. And I started to um, re understand why I was feeling euphoric. Because I was feeling really euphoric. And at first, I didn't understand why. And I was telling my family 
that I know I'm going to be okay. Why is everybody so worried? It's going to be fine. I'm really going to be okay. But everybody was being really cautious. Um, but by the fourth day, the doctor actually said that my tumors had shrunk by 60 or 70 percent just to the touch, wow. just by touching my neck. I still had the open skin lesions, so I had bandages and all. But because um, I was like really euphoric and the swelling had gone down and the tumors had gone down and I wanted to sit up and I wanted to listen to music because I love music. Mm. And I told my husband, um, could you please bring me my iPod? I really want to listen to music. And so he connected my my iPod and I couldn't put the earphones in because of all the tubes and wires and I had some bandages. So he connected up little speakers and so I was listening to dance music and I was having my husband, brother, mother visiting me all the time. And in the end, the other patients, because I was in an intensive care unit, the other patients started complaining about me and their families started complaining about me saying that, what is this woman doing in here? Because people here are really sick. They're dying. Wow. <laughs> So the doctor had to, um, he moved me out of intensive care by the fourth day and into a regular room. And then my healing was just really, really rapid after that. And um, they, they wanted to, they did a, um, um, what they call a, a biopsy of the spine, where they take out the fluid from the spine, which is really, really painful. Mm. And when they did that, um, when they did that operation, they they didn't find any cancer in, in the spine. And then they did a lymph node biopsy, and they didn't find any cancer in the lymph node. And uh, they just kept poking and looking for cancer because they didn't believe it was gone. And for you, so you had this, like, invincible, I'm, I'm back, uh, nothing can stop me type of way of, it was just you are living life again so fast so rapidly so the, everybody must have been so surprised and what a change that creates in one's life did you start to have immediate conversations with other people and about it's... this experience and with doctors and oh my god i have hundreds of questions now <laughs> okay uh, i i love answering questions it took me a little while to unravel it because I was quite confused you know when people were shocked by by what had happened my own doctor my own doctor oncologist who treated me um, he made the gesture of throwing my my file my medical file in the bin he actually said to me I don't know what to write in your medical file and he made the gesture of as though pretending to throw it in the dustbin. He said, I really don't know. I don't even know what to make of you. That's what he oh, said oh. to me. And um, I went through a phase uh, of being a little bit confused after that, of not knowing what to make of it, what happened. Um, I really didn't know because I didn't know, like, was it, was it my higher self? Is it, what is it? Like, is it God? What is it? And um, and for me, like these beliefs like that, like for me, if I use the term God, I can say it was God, but God has no form. God is formless. The minute you put form on God, again, you've put limitations. There is no such limitation. So I didn't have a complete understanding of what to attribute it to. But I knew that something big had happened, something really, really huge had happened. And I had connected to something, and I knew I'd connected to something. And that something that I connected to made me feel as if I was that something in that state when I was without my body. Mm -hmm. I was also part of that something. I was everything. I was invincible. Mm. And... And I was connected to every body and every living thing. It was like I became everything. I became the universe in that state. So you start realizing that you had the universe inside of you. Yeah, you have the universe inside of you. And we all do. And we all do. We all do. We are all at the 
it feels as though we are all at the center of the universe. And, and when we find that place, that center place, when you find that center place of the universe, and that's what to me meaning, um, meaning getting centered to me means finding your place at the center of the universe. And it's when you find that place mm. that you can start allowing everything that is truly yours to enter into your life. And everything that you get, like all the amazing things that can happen to you, they're truly yours. When you're at that center place, that's when you can just allow them to come in. So it's not about pursuing, because the minute we talk about pursuing something or going after something, the fact that you feel you need to go after it means you don't really think it's yours in the first place. Mm. But when you're at that centered place, then everything that is yours just comes to you. You just have to allow it. And that's, that's kind of what I discovered. Yeah, this is, this is uh, very different than how most of us have been brought up. And I guess how you've been brought up. So now, how, how do we really create our reality? Is there really anything for us to do or just relax in this place, knowing that all is well? In many ways, it's the latter. It's about really relaxing and the journey to creating our reality is to me, is the same as the journey to discovering ourself. Because the more you know who you really are, the more you will allow that which is truly yours to come into your life. Because you, once you know that you are an amazing, magnificent being that is worthy and deserving of everything that that you desire, once you know that you are worthy and you deserve love, unconditional love, in the way that you desire it, you only have to realize it and allow it in. Because we seem to believe that we have to compete. It's like, oh, how can everybody's desires be fulfilled? It's like, how can you get what you want and I get what you want? There isn't enough to go around. But we're all different. What you want is different from what I want. And the, and the universe needs all of us. The reason why we are the way we are is, you know, we are all facets of the universe. We've come here to express who we are. You've come here to be the beautiful Lilu Mace, mm -hmm. and I've come here to be me. And if I stopped being me, then the universe would be deprived of me. And if you stopped being you, the universe would be deprived of you. So you have to be as you as you can be. Mm -hmm. And and yet we are not um, needed. I mean, it, it's like there's, it seems to be this fine balance too. Is that our soul? Um, we we all. So you're saying we all have a purpose. But our. But but, but our at the same time, at the same time as we're those. God living beings, you know, facets of gods on this planet, um, the ego at some point can get in too and say, oh, I am needed. But not really, it seems. It's paradoxical, isn't it? Tell me, um, let me see if I understand you co correctly. When you say we're needed, you mean that the people in the planet needs us, like people need our you. Our purpose, our purpose, each of us needing to find our purpose in life to help the collective all. But we, least, yes, we are helping the collective by following our purpose. As, because if you think of it this way, at our core, let's say if all of us, at our core, at our soul, at our essence, we're pure, but pure what? We're pure love. What else can you be at your core? Because your core, that is your center. That is your God center. That is where we all come from and that is where we all go. That is the point at which we are all connected. So what can that be if it is God, if it is our essence, if it is our soul, if it is our core? What else can it be but pure love? And so... When you get in touch with that, if your only purpose is to get in touch with that, mm 
When you're in touch with that, and that is who you are being, what else can you be but love? And yeah, what else can you yeah, do? Yeah, and yet there is in many, cir in many circumstances, though, um, and that's, I think that's part of what we fear also, not having experienced fully the light, is to be all that light. Because we have seen around us uh, people that because of because of really expanding our life and expanding our reach and expanding our power and what have you, then the ego crawls back in and there is this other false identity that starts emerging, uh, this identification to self. And there seems to be, um, there's nothing to watch for from and be afraid of from what I'm hearing from you. Yet it's some. It feels like it's something that holds us back from fully unleashing all the light that we have because we've been brought up in this society that there's something wrong if we do. That is that is actually the way. Of, that is the way of duality. It's the way that we are in human form. Yes, we all have. We all have an ego, and that's just. Um, that gives us our individuality. And I think as long as we're expressing through our physical bodies, it's diff I don't think that we will escape our egos. So the best thing that we can do is to accept our egos. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't, I don't believe in actually trying to overcome our egos because I think the more we try to suppress our egos, the more our egos will push back. <laughs> So, so perhaps the best thing is just to accept that we are ego beings, physical, yeah. as long as we're expressing in the physical, because this is why even while we're in physical life, um, we, we're in duality. We all feel separate from each other because we have bodies, physical bodies, we have egos. And this is why people um, feel, they feel separate and they feel, they compete with each other. They feel fear. This is why we even have crimes, and you know, you have criminals, and uh, so, and uh, because people in our physical bodies, we don't necessarily feel all that, the oneness, and so we we do. It's just something I guess we have to accept while we're here. Mm -hmm. And allow ourselves to experience this unconditional self-love because this is truly your message. Yeah. Unconditional self-love. Because you've never felt from when I read so much love. Like you know you are loved now and from this place all is possible. Yes. I, what I really want, my real message to people is that at your core, at our core, mine, yours, everybody's, all of us at our core, it's who we are. We are love. We really are. And so when you are being yourself, when you're totally being yourself, all you can be is love because that's who you are at your core. Mm, wow. And so don't be afraid to be who you are. Yes. Anita, you're such a blessing. Thank you for coming back. Thank you for having the courage to... And, and the love to come back here and share this beautiful message. How long ago was that, this your near-death experience? It was in 2006. It was five years ago. And now you are physically vibrant and <laughs> all is I'm, well? Your life must have truly transformed? Oh, gosh. My life has really transformed. Um, and the beautiful Wayne Dyer has been part of that transformation. He's just been amazing. Uh, and a lot of things have happened since then because I wrote about my story on a, um, on a near-death website and people discovered it. Even medical doctors discovered it and approached me and asked to see my records and have actually flown to Hong Kong to, to meet me and to go to my hospital and to go through my records and have said that whichever way they look at it, I should be dead. So uh, it's been quite amazing. And then the way my story reached Wayne Dyer has been amazing. And, um, and he's put me in touch with you. And uh, he's beautiful because he's going to be writing the forward to my book. Mm, when so. is your book going to be out? It's going to be out at the beginning of 2012. Perfect timing. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How beautiful. And and um, if people watching want to read more, I know that if you just type Anita M N D E on Google, then you'll have a lot more information right there. Do you yes. have a website too now? I do. It's called um, anitamorjani.com. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you for this delicious moment. And I cannot wait to fly to Hong Kong to meet you and uh, do this again in person. Um, I'm ready to take a flight. I was ready to, you know, <laughs> we're, thanks to technology, we can do it through Skype from Boston to Hong Kong. But um, what a delight. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. You're beautiful. Thank you so much. Hello, Anita. Hi, Lilu. How are you? I'm doing so well. It's so good to see you again on Skype a year later our first, after our first interview. Yeah, it's been a year already. The time has flown. <laughs> One year in August. One year and uh, I'm really, really amazed how many people got interested in your story and have seen this particular video. Over 300,000 video views on YouTube alone. And I'm not even talking yeah. of the number of people that have uploaded it on their own channel and then translated it in other languages. I'm so yeah. grateful for your story and I know a lot of people are. So this is wonderful to have this opportunity to speak again. Wow, thank you for, for organizing this again. I thought, oh, what a great way to celebrate the anniversary of that video. Because that, of all the interviews I have ever done, that one has hit, had the most hits. Yeah. Well, I must say that, uh, of course, Dr. Wayne Dyer that introduced us has widely spoken about this video throughout all his conferences. And you've been traveling around the world from my understanding with him your your book is yeah. not out and people that want to know more about your story of course i encourage them to get your book dying to be me which is my okay. journey from cancer to near-death experience to true healing and this is what we're going to talk about your lessons from this near-death experience and this is why i think i mean why do you think so many people got interested about your story i think it's because um i focus on the reason for living and that's one of the because the biggest lessons that I brought with me after nearly dying I feel that nearly dying taught me how to live and I find that when I'm when I speak about my experience other than actually speaking about getting sick from the cancer and and experiencing the other realm when I speak about the lessons my lessons are really focused on living life and living life to the fullest um, I don't really spend a, life, uh, a lot of time talking about death itself. And I think maybe that's why a lot of people are attracted to my story. Yeah, and these near-death experiences, because I just want to uh, summarize a little bit your story, or maybe you can, but in 2002 you, had, uh, you were diagnosed with a lymphoma, cancer. That's, that's right. And in 2006 and you had this transition. I mean, you went towards death you've met death <laughs> yes yes it was I reached end stage cancer it was stage 4b in 2006 and my organs shut down and the tumors had spread all over my body and um, and I went into a coma and the doctors had told my family that these were my final hours and that was when I felt my transition into the other realm and learned a lot of things amongst them. I learned what caused my cancer. I, I also learned that it wasn't my time and I had the choice to come back. Mm. You is... speak a lot in your book about the fear. And when we read, we feel a lot the fear that you felt once you were diagnosed, but you also speak of all the fear that you felt during your whole lifetime. That might be one of the main reasons of your cancer. I mean, how do you, did you try to reason all this and how this came about? Yeah, in fact, one of the things that I learned from being in the other realm was um, I was in like the state of incredible clarity. I had so much clarity as to why I had the cancer, why I was in that situation. So it was like I was, I could see my life every decision, everything, every thought I had, every action I had in my entire life 
summed up together, the total sum of everything brought me to that point in my life at death's door and I could see why I was there. And if I summed it up in one word, that word would be fear because I, I used to fear everything. You know, I used to fear not being good enough. I used to fear um, displeasing people, not meeting people's expectations. I used to be a people pleaser. So I feared everything um, in like even about uh, not being spiritual enough. I even feared death. I feared the afterlife. Um, I used to fear feel chemotherapy that I had, and uh, I feared chemotherapy. I feared cancer. My best friend had cancer, so I feared getting cancer. Um, I also feared things like uh, things that I believed caused cancer. Everything from using uh, overuse of mobile phones, uh, microwaves, and you know all kinds of things. And the more I would read about things that. Uh, caused cancer in order to try and prevent it or in order to help my friend who had cancer, the more I would read about it, the more fearful I became about getting it because yeah. it seemed to me that everything caused cancer. Yeah. And, and then when I was diagnosed with cancer, oh my God, then of course I was totally in fear. But um, when I was diagnosed, what happens unfortunately is a lot of well-meaning people who believe they're helping you. Um, they would send me emails that, oh, this should help you, you should avoid this because of your cancer, you should avoid this. And it was as though I had to avoid everything, you know, like basically, it seemed to me that living in the 21st century caused cancer. Yeah. yeah. Everything. So, and so your husband had kind of to be a gatekeeper at some point because... Uh, yeah. None of it would really help, but you, you went through, you, you tried to find a holistic uh, way, I mean, another uh, um, non-traditional medical approach. You tried everything, because I guess when we're diagnosed with cancer, it's kind of, let me try it all. I mean, you even went yes. to India and tried Ayurveda and, and all of it. Yes. And to finally come back in your, your own country to see your family and then you were injected with more fears. What was your, but what was your, um, your what could you advise to people um, that go through this? Because maybe it's not cancer that we have, but it might be something else. And we're, we're ready to do a bit everything. And sometimes we go a little yes. bit overboard. I mean, do you have some advice uh, in that? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I do. In fact, one of the things um, that I dealt with, what causes the fear, is the overload of information. And so there's a lot of confusion because no matter what information you get, if as soon as you start doing research, you will find conflicting information. You will always find conflicting information to anything. Mm -hmm. If you choose to look, you will find conflicting information. So first of all, my advice is to follow your gut feeling you know and stop with all the research and the googling because I had people that t told me you must research more information is power sometimes it isn't sometimes too much information creates more fear and causes more confusion so um, I would actually suggest to people number one is follow your gut feeling don't consistent don't continuously just do more and more research the other thing that's also really important even before that is do not treat anything in your life including your illness whatever is your illness whether it's cancer or something else do not treat it like a battle don't fight it work with it embrace it love where you are now and then listen to what it's trying to tell you um, identify what gifts it's brought you and work with it work with it you can research it but research it from a point of love not from a point of fear and only when you approach your challenges your health challenges from the point of view of love can you actually overcome all that fear so in other words it's like okay I embrace where I am this is not a battle this is my body this is my body communicating to me. It's got a message for me. Even if I don't know the message right now, it's okay. I'm going to love myself. I'm going to love my illness. I'm going to work with the illness, whatever it is. And I am now going to start looking into what can make me feel better. So 
the first and foremost, it's not a battle. Don't fight your own body. Work mm. with it. Mm. That's, That's the main. Yeah. Yeah, I love when you talked about being centered. And also that being centered is finding our place in the center of the, of the universe and kind of allowing the situation or the, um, the, the healing process to also come to us. And this is also something that we can use in, to find our own life purpose. I mean, this is not yes. just a conversation about cancer here. It's, it's a big, big, bold, universal conversation. Yes, it is. And, and if I can add something even to the, to the perspective of having cancer, just in what we were saying is that one of the things I used to feel, what used to drive me to do the research is this feeling like, if I don't get the answer, if I don't find it, the cancer is going to eat me up. Mm. It's like a, a race against cancer. That's the fear talking. That's the fear driving you. And in fact, it's that very fear that is actually feeding the cancer. So the thing is to just stop and just stop. I learned that I have to stop my mind anytime I get into that spiraling fear about anything in life. It's really just stop and remind myself there's no battle. There's no race. I'm at the center of my universe. I'm only fighting myself. I'm only battling myself. So stop. Just embrace myself wherever I am and just remind myself that this is my life, there's no fight, there's nothing out there, it's all in here, and then from that point, just start to feel, okay, what, what now makes me feel good? What brings me joy? It's getting back into that place. Um, mm -hmm. And also, I would also say, don't make your life about the illness. Don't obsess over the illness. That's another thing that causes fear, is obsessing over the illness, obsessing over anything, even if it's a job loss or anything. And these are how we lose um, our place in the center. If we talk about the center of the whole universe, we lose our place in the center of ourselves. This is how we get lost. I mean, and I really mean how we lose ourselves is when we start to spiral into this feeling of fear. And so we wake up every day and all we obsess about is that whatever it is, whether it's, it's the financial situation or the health situation. And we make every day about battling that situation. And all that does is that it creates even more fear and it gets us spiraling further uh, and, and makes us feel even more lost. So it's kind of, you're recommending then, if I hear this correctly, to have this unconditionality about ourselves to learn unconditional love and just accepting things as they are and sit in there. So even though if you you were seeing your body little by little, I mean, becoming, uh, I guess, ugly in some way, I mean, and you were hurting and you were and you were seeing the sadness of others. So what a challenge to meet with unconditional love inside of that. And, and we all have events, you know, really, that are pushing us to, to really lose faith and to lose this love and to be angry and go through depression. You, you, those are phases you had to go through. And at some yes. point you were kind of saved by this near-death experience. So I'm sure some people are even thinking, but gosh, I wish I had this near-death experience. So then I would have this feeling and know this place. But to get there in life, in, uh, in, in, on earth, is a big yeah. paradigm shift huh? without having to experience what's above or below or everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. Sometimes um, I feel, you know, there are moments where I feel, um, most of the time, in fact, I feel very blessed that, and thankful for the grace of having that experience. But on the other hand, there are times where I feel that those that haven't come back, those that went on, are the ones that are blessed because that was such an amazing state. And perhaps the ones that went on are actually the blessed ones. And maybe I'm one of the unlucky ones that actually came back to, to again face this physical world because it is a lot more challenging over here. And also talking about, you brought up a very, very good point about watching, watching myself deteriorate, watching the depression. I absolutely went through all of that as my body deteriorated. Now, 
a lot of people during that time um, mm -hmm. believed that positive thinking can help you through anything. To an extent it can, but what that belief was doing to me, because many people would say to me, you have to try and think positive. Mm -hmm. I started to believe that it was my thoughts that created my illness and that I wasn't thinking positive enough. So constantly I was judging myself that why am I feeling depressed? I've got to get out of this depression feeling. I've got to feel more positive and it's because I'm feeling negative that I'm going down the spiral. I've got to think more positive. So my near-death experience actually taught me it's not just positive thinking. It's more about being yourself and loving yourself regardless of what you're going through. That's more important than thinking positive and that's what I mean. Like no matter, even if my body is deteriorating, the idea was, um, of course I didn't do this at the time, I didn't know this, but what I learned from the experience and what I tell other people is that no matter where you are right now, no matter what you're doing, no matter what state of your life, the first thing to do is to learn to love yourself. And for many people, that's a challenge. That's very, very difficult. Like if I were to ask you to write on a sheet of paper all the things about you that you think you need to improve. All oh the my things goodness. That are good enough, yeah, we w you know, most people, yeah, most people would do that. And you, you know, most people say, oh, I could just keep writing on and on. And whether I give people three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, it's not enough. Now, if I said to you on a sheet of paper, write all the things you love about yourself, everything that's amazing, all your positive qualities. Most people, they might, they might write a couple of things and then they're stuck. They can't go very far. Why? Why is it that we are habitually in this, in this frame of mind where it's so easy for us to constantly be thinking of things that are wrong with us but not things that are right with us. Why are we so self-critical? Why, why is it so easy to judge ourselves, to have this inner voice that's constantly beating ourselves up, but not the other way around? For me, I believed it was that that caused my cancer. Mm -hmm. It was that. And also, how it's can we judge that uh, when something happens to us, it's a bad thing? How do we know yes. really what it's the gift and the present it's going to bring? Exactly, because if you ask me today, I would say the cancer is the best gift I've ever had. And we don't know this when we're looking at life from a very limited and narrow perspective. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't know this. And um, so we Beautiful. can only know. <laughs> Thank you. I, I love the cover. I just want to show it again <laughs> because it is, I mean, none of this, this conversation would not happen. The, the millions of people that have heard your message, your connection with Wayne Dyer, the, what you're bringing to this, con this big consciousness, this big global shift happening on the planet, and all of it. So it's, it's, it's so visible, you know, we're, we're even holding it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I, thank I, I, and it's, yeah. it's totally thanks to Wayne Dyer that all this, you know, the book came about and the story is publicized. I mean, bless him, he's been such an amazing influence in yeah. my life. But how can but, we judge the, yeah, you, so, so for you it was definitely, even for the four years, I mean, you had huge lemon-sized uh, tumors, uh, tumors and, 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 and then you were really, really hurting. I mean, let's tell the truth, it was, it was I tough. was in pain, I was in total pain, I cannot, I mean, it was, I would not wish this on my worst enemy, what I went through where I couldn't even lie down without choking. <clears throat> I just would, I would not wish this on anybody. Yeah. Um, when my muscles deteriorated, my skin just opened up into lesions so the toxins could come out. Mm. It was just the most painful thing. Mm. But um, after, after my near-death experience, and in fact, in the clarity of the near-death experience, what I understood that this was just my own energy turned against me but because I had always turned myself against me. It was a reflection of my own beliefs about myself. Mm -hmm. It's not about positive thinking per se. Um, yes, positive thinking helps but it, 
you have to get to a place where you feel positive, yeah. not just plaster over what you're feeling. Yeah. Because what then happens is I was beating myself up for not thinking more positively. Yeah. I was so it's beating really, myself. Sorry, mm -hmm. you're beating yourself. Go. No, I was, I was going to say, I really feel that it's about really this transparency, this authenticity. It's us in front of ourselves. I mean, it's just you and you. Yeah. Me and me. There is no, you know, it's, it's really, it comes down to that. Yes, it's me and me. It's like, who am I? Am I being myself? Am I being authentic? Am I allowing myself to express who I am? Or am I constantly processing and being who I think other people want me to be? Am I constantly reacting or acting because I want the reactions, the correct reactions from other people? Am I being this person because I want to be accepted or am I being this person because this is who I am? Mm. It's, it's all that kind of thing and that is how we judge ourselves. The fact that we feel we have to suppress who we are and be someone else that is a judgment. That's a self-judgment. That's a signal. You're sending yourself that I'm not good enough. So I've got to keep trying to be someone else. I'm not spiritual enough. I've got to work harder at being spiritual. How can you not be spiritual? We are spiritual. We're born spiritual. Mm. Yeah. And from that place of total alignment, of, of centeredness, uh, Miracles are possible and it feels like yeah. I, I could feel this kind of force we're emanating, this light, this frequency that is so powerful that people cannot always put words on it, but the, the transformation happens there. The same way that dolphins are in the ocean and in Hawaii and all around the world and when you meet them, just at their contact, you feel transformed. So there's really yeah. nothing for us to do, isn't there? There is nothing for you to actually do or to physically go and search and chase or pursue. It's, it's about being, it's about being. And when you are in that space of being, it's that space that we, you talk about where miracles are possible. And even, even if somebody chooses not to come back to physical life, like even if somebody has cancer and even if they reach the end and if they don't turn around that's also fine because maybe that's their journey mm -hmm. because it's not the end just because we've ceased to express through the body it's not the end of our journey you know and I'll, I'll give you an example with that um, my father my father and I we had a very rocky relationship when he was in physical life but when I met him in the other realm all he had for me was pure, unconditional love. That's all he had for me. And, and I understood that in physical, we're limited by our, our beliefs, our cultures, our values. So everything we express, it gets filtered. You know, it gets filtered through these things. And we do everything the best we know how. So my father was loving me in the best way he knew how in physical. But because I kind of grew up in a different culture and generation that was a lot of clash. But when we're without our culture and without everything, there's only pure, unconditional love. And I feel my father around me all the time. I feel him guiding me. I have a better relationship with him today, and I love him more unconditionally today than I did when he was in the physical form. And it's highly possible that for some people, their work is easier after they cross over. You just, you just don't know. You know, we don't know. Sometimes when people choose to cross over, it's not because they didn't love their loved ones enough. It could be because they loved them very much. And that was the better choice for the people they loved. Mm, I like that version. Yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful. And, <laughs> Yes. The, what are some of your recommendations for the family and loved ones that are around somebody? And again, it's for cancer, but it's also in life. How can we be uh, uh, around that? I mean, would something have helped you when you were in coma that, that people around the bed could have done or at any point uh, that you would have liked yeah. to hear or to feel since you could feel really everything from my understanding? You would just go and think of a person and you would immediately feel their emotions. So is there a way that 
people in similar situation or, or even if we have friends that lost their job or that are going through bankruptcy and um, we want to help but we just don't know how and it feels like we're adding to the drama instead of <laughs> instead of creating space for the person just to be yes well if somebody's in a coma be aware that they can hear you um, really the chances are extremely high that they can hear you and they can hear sometimes not only just the people in the room but beyond they can very often even hear or sense what their loved ones are thinking and going through so of course you will feel sad and everything but bring comfort to the person in the coma talk to them tell them how much you love them but if they want to move on give them that space to move on give them the permission that it's okay to move on. I let you, I set you free to do what you feel you need to do. But just be aware that they can hear you. More importantly, what I'd like to also share is if you have a loved one that's very, very sick, they need to know that they are loved unconditionally. And if you're caring for somebody that's very sick, they need to feel that everything that you're doing for them you're not doing it out of an obligation, but you're doing it because you love them, absolutely because you love them. And whatever, absolutely whatever choice of healing they choose, whether it's Ayurvedic or naturopathic or Chinese medicine or chemotherapy or radiation or whatever it is, do not tell them that they have made the wrong choice. Support them in their choice. Mm -hmm. That is really, really important. It doesn't matter what it is. Even if you have strong opinions against their choice, and, but that is the choice they've chosen, do not tell them your opinions at that time because that can create a lot of fear or what will happen is that they will start to cut you out from their life as they need to go through yeah. whatever treatment because they need to feel secure. They need to feel that this treatment is healing them. So again, if you're caring for somebody that is going through really serious illness, whatever treatment they choose, help them to in fact feel and visualize that their choice of treatment is actually healing them. They need to feel it. They need to believe it. They need to feel better as whatever it is, whatever treatment is being digested, ingested, they need to feel that every cell in their body is rejuvenating. And it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's chemo, radiation, Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. They need to be surrounded by people who are going to make them feel that they are healing. Mm -hmm. They really need that. As much as you went through your own journey, the people, your loved ones, have gone through their own journey. And it's, it feels like it's also an opportunity for, 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 for them. And it has been an opportunity for them, whether they accept it then or not but to yeah. move forward in their own journey into oneness as well. Yeah, it's been quite a journey for, for many people, many people in my life, you know. Um, my closest family stuck by me right through. There were many um, friends who, during that time, because they didn't agree with my choice of treatment, I actually stopped seeing them. But then years later or after I recovered, I reconnected with them again. and and there was total understanding. There were some people I lost along the way, but everybody has gone through their own journey. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, uh, but thankfully, I, my closest family have stuck right by me. My closest friends have stuck by me and, and I've made a lot of new friends in the journey and it's been quite an amazing journey. A lot, um, lot new friends. <laughs> <laughs> really, a lot, lot, yes. And you know, people say, wow, that cancer damn near killed you. I say, no, that cancer saved my life. That cancer was a gift. I wow. wouldn't turn back the clock. I wouldn't change that for anything. Wow. I really wouldn't. How do you see now what is real? I mean, what's, how do you see reality? What do you want to tell us or teach us or, or, or transmit to us about that? I feel um, now, for me, reality is very different. I used to, again, believe that I had to pursue things, you know, like, just like healing for cancer. I felt I had to do the research. I have to pursue the healing. I have to do it all. And I wonder if it's, it was like a race, a race against the cancer. 
my life was like a race, you know, like getting um, in, in, I used to work in the, in the corporate field and that's also very competitive. Um, I used to be in, in the um, fashion accessory business and it was very, very competitive and I've been through downturns and losing my job and all of that stuff. Now, um, I would never go back to that because I don't even believe that, I believe that is the illusion that people buy into. And life doesn't need to be like that. It really doesn't. I don't see time in the same way. I don't feel that we have a race against time anymore because everything is possible. Everything exists simultaneously. And if we can be still, we can actually fall into a completely different reality. And to give you my own example of um, actually, this is after my near-death experience, um, I started sharing my story on the internet and I wasn't doing it to, you know, uh, for any other reason except to help other people. I wasn't even using my full name and I, I had another job. I, I started working as an a intercultural trainer where I was working with people talking about Chinese culture, Hong Kong culture. But just in my spare time, I was writing blogs and I was answering people's questions about cancer, about near, being near death, about the other realm and so on. But I reached a point <clears throat> where I was um, attacked by a group of skeptics and they were very, very persistent. They started saying a lot of things that um, brought back a little bit of the fear back into my mind. They started questioning me in such mm -hmm. a way about, mm -hmm. so what if this has happened to you? How does it help anybody else? And, mm -hmm. um, and, and all kinds of things they were, they were saying to me. Because of that, I stopped. I actually stopped posting completely. And I went into that little bit of fear and then I thought, mm, maybe, um, maybe you know, I was wrong or whatever. So I started focusing on my work a little bit more. And then I started to fall back into some of my old routines. But then one day, a friend of mine just invited me to come and speak about my near-death experience and in her healing center. And I said, no, I don't do that anymore. And she said, what, are you crazy? I've heard when you speak, you're so passionate. That's who you are. It'll really help the people who come into my center. So I went and did it for her. And when I spoke, I realized that, yeah, that's really who I am. And I, so that night, I decided, okay, I'm going to stop. I'm just going to allow. And so I found that center again. I found that place within me, that place of allowing. No more pursuing. Let's just see what happens. Yeah. The next morning, in my email box, was an email from Hay House saying, Wayne Dyer has read your story and we'd like you to publish a book. Mm. So this is what I mean. You know, it's like... The universe, there are things happening in the background and we, we don't know. We don't know what's going on. All Time is not linear. It's all happening and you can grasp a completely different point of time if your state is just in a more relaxed state rather than a more controlled state. When we're in fear, we're in that controlled state. It's what I talk about with the warehouse, with the torchlight. We're controlling where we want that beam to shine. But if we can relax and diffuse our focus, it's like then the whole, all the possibilities, all the, everything in the warehouse suddenly comes into our reach. And mm. it just depends which one we allow into our lives. Because mm. with a thought, we can, as you're explaining, go through a future event and see the scenario and what can happen then and then choose to go there. But we could also change that thought about that event and it can yes. be a positive one, and we can just let that be there. So just our own, it's, a, it's quite amazing when we slow down the time and just look in the stillness, how you yes. can actually shift from one possibility to the next and how you, we can see and realize that we're co-creators or creators. Yes. We are creators, yes. Because when we are in the state of fear, our thought is locked on to something negative, and that's what's creating the fear. So our thought, once it's locked on to that, it's like we are then more likely to move towards that because we've just locked into that. So this is why it's, be it's always better to relax and not 
to believe or not to, uh, if we can just step back. And the way to snap out of fear, I say, because sometimes it's very hard to just think yourself out of fear. Mm -hmm. So the thing to do is to distract yourself and find something to do which brings you into a state of joy. Find something that just changes your state completely. So whatever it is, whether it's music or art or going out in nature, just do something completely different or meditation, absolutely anything. Get out of that state of fear which you're locked into. Just get out of that. Stay out of that. And when you're in this, what I call it a diffused state, hmm. you know, because being in a state of fear is a very sharp focus state where you're kind of locked into one state. Get into a diffused state. Get back into the state where all the possibilities lay there in front of you and you haven't locked into any one. And you're open. It's like I'm open. I feel like I'm in a state of ambiguity. I don't know what's going to happen next, but I'm open. When you're open and then you can find a state of joy and just follow your bliss, follow your joy, that's when you find that the amazing possibilities start coming to you. We don't follow our joy enough, and that's, that's the biggest problem right now, today, with everybody. We don't follow our joy. We do what we think we should do mm -hmm. rather than what yeah. our heart tells us to do. We don't do what makes our heart sing. Yeah, but it feels too that it, there's a pretty big challenge that is uh, coming to us uh, that is already there, but um, uh, maybe because of fear we're not facing it totally. And I, I would love to hear what is your perception on, you know, there's so many things that are kind of we can see as going wrong in so many different industries. And one of them is the spirituality and the personal development. I think there is personally a, a lot of abuse and manipulation that is being done and a lot of people are being deceived and mm -hmm. so uh, we can be and I've been personally challenged by some people that I've interviewed to remove those interviews because each time you start steering things up a little bit or going for what you believe as you did with the near-death experience and being on stage then there is this kind of tsunami that goes towards us and then we have the choice whether to continue or not and really strongly believe. But it feels to me like a lot of us right now are having to face and have to stand up for what we believe in and, yeah. and, and act and, 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 and ask for transparency from our leaders and, and ask for a better world. But it shakes us up truly. I mean, it's, it really comes down to really, really, really being centered, doesn't it? Yes, it does come down to being centered, but if, if I understand you correctly, you mean that also it's about fearing, um, like say, other in this, in this um, new, new way of thinking or the way we're moving mm -hmm. forward, you mean even fearing what people are saying, the messages that are coming, is that what you mean also? Not everybody there is good. And yes, we have to also be love ourselves enough to not also take everything that comes our way and also if we want to take it to another state, also challenge these people. And there is the yes. guru, guru status and you know that being Indian and having been raised in India too, that it's yes. a big one right there. Exactly. Now I like, I'm so happy you said all that because, because one of the things that I also tell people is that you are your own guru and that is so important. This is why it's so important to love yourself and to know that your answers are within. You know, um, I don't have answers for you. I can share my experience and I share it only in the hope that it helps you and that is the case with everybody. Nobody is your guru, at least not for your entire life. There are people, there are teachers that will appear along the way, but they are people who will touch you in different ways at different parts of your life. But it doesn't mean that they are in some way more superior than you. Nobody is more superior than you. We are all exactly equal. And when people realize that, it's not about, um, it's not really about so much about telling people not to guruize themselves. It's about telling people don't guruize anyone else. You are your own guru. And when we all realize that, there will be nobody, you know, because nobody will worship these false gurus. Or anything. They're, 
they yeah. they feed on people who worship them. Yeah. So same thing for media that is reporting uh, di that is disinforming people or like television some information or politicians. I mean, if there would be no followers in all those realms, they would not yes. exist. Exactly. If there are no followers, they would not exist, and that's exactly what I mean. So so this is this is the thing. So even. Um, people who are giving false information and so on. If we didn't guruize people, they wouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that's I think why it's an it's important so, message to these days. Yeah, It is a really important message and it is an important message and that's why it's so important for people to know how to access their own truth. Their, your own truth is in here and it's a barometer. Now if information you are receiving, you know, whether it's from someone who's a self-proclaimed guru or whoever, if that information is actually making you feel fearful or making you feel worse about yourself, then, then don't follow them. Just don't follow them. It's not right for you. They could be right for somebody, but it's not right for you. It always has to feel freeing and liberating. It has to feel good for you. Mm -hmm. And I even tell people that even if what if things I say, if it doesn't resonate with you, don't listen to me. Discount it. Discharge it. You can even think that I'm crazy. It's fine. I'd rather you did that than listen and then feel fearful because the whole idea is about not feeling fearful. That's the whole idea. Feeling the love. The love. Yeah. The real love. <laughs> the real love. And the real love starts from actually loving ourselves. Yeah. Loving ourselves enough to know that we are our own guru. Mm, beautiful. Well, Anita, this is so delicious. I really, really look forward to meeting you in person at the I Can Do It conference over in Glasgow, where you will be, and Wayne Dyer will yes. be there. So this is I in Scotland. Wait. Yes, Scotland, and uh, for everybody that wants to come, it will be wonderful to, to meet everyone and get together. And I, I can't wait. I really um, i am looking forward to that moment, and I want to thank you again for your, the courage that you have to, to do all these interviews, to travel, to, to share what's so uh, for you with others. It takes definitely courage, and it takes a lot of time, and um, so thank you very, very much. Thank you, as always. I can't wait to meet you in person. <laughs> much, much love. Bye. Hop. Right.